Hi everybody. For those of you who haven't been following me on YouTube, uh, I am Dr. Craig Malkin. I'm a clinical psychologist and lecturer for Harvard Medical School. I'm an expert on narcissism. I also have training, I don't often mention this, I also have training, uh, intensive training in trauma, uh, PTSD and complex PTSD. I worked a lot with trauma survivors in my early training. Uh, and the reason for this, it might be a series of videos, I'm going to play it by ear, but it, it, to kind of give back to people during the book launch, I decided to do an event where uh, on my Facebook page, I held an event called Real Narcissists where people could post all their questions and ask me anything they wanted to about uh, dealing with narcissists in their, in their life and difficult experiences that they've had. And I'm going to try to get through as many of those questions as possible. And as I said, it might just turn into a, a, a series of videos. This works extremely well too because for those of you who haven't been following me on Facebook, I actually shattered my right hand, which makes it very difficult to write. So for me to be able to do a video to reach you actually is especially helpful. So what I'm going to do is you might see me looking a little shifty now and then because I'm going to actually just look over at the documents. Uh, the Real Narcissist event on Facebook, first of all, I want to say thank you so much so so much to everybody who contributed uh, because it takes great courage to share your story I'm n nobody really I, 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 uh, I'm really honored that people felt comfortable sharing many of them posting some of them private messages but sharing your story with me about what you've been through and the kind of help you need uh, and there were a lot of questions that came up again and again about how do I recover. So let me just say up front, one of, if you're trying to recover from a difficult relationship, particularly an abusive relationship, uh, one of the most important things you can do is to break your isolation. Often, very, very often, people who have been in abusive relationships become isolated, uh, and that is so deleterious to recovery. It's so hard to get your bearings and to know what's real and to know what's not. Very often people are uh, subjected to an insidious process where the reality is questioned constantly when they're in an abusive relationship. So there was actually a study, it's probably 10 years old now, where they asked, where the researchers just looked at different groups and of people who have been through uh, not actually abusive relationships, but a horrible trauma of some kind, uh, earthquake, 9-11, things like that. And it turned out the people who did best, who were the least likely to develop symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder after that event, were the ones who were not isolated, who had support. So um, I just want to underscore that the best thing that you can do for yourself if you've been through a, a, an abusive experience or if you've been through a really traumatic relationship is to make sure that you have lots of supports, you break your isolation, you need, and you do stuff like if you find a community, this turned into a wonderful supportive community, if you find a community like this, share your story. It's so important to recovery. So I'm just going to go through, and here I am looking over uh, many of these had a lot of overlap. A, a lot of the same questions came up again and again around relationships in particular. And really, one big one was what can I, how, can I really trust this person? Uh, how do I know if they're willing to change? And there, there's actually a very clear answer to that. Uh, but let me read just one I'm going to say an emblematic question, uh, and we'll go from there. Susan asks, should I trust my narcissist husband who only changed his emotionally abusive behavior toward me and our kids after his infidelities were discovered? Should he be trusted? How can they change on a dime like that? We've been married for 15 years. Uh, most of that felt like he resented me. I'm going to skip over some of this because I don't want to put too much identifying information. Uh, he's surrounded by women friends uh, in the place where he works. 
Uh, he refuses to go to a counselor. What's the likelihood of relapse back to abuse and or the lies and cheating? How long can he keep it up until he gets bored? In other words, should I trust this change? So really what it centers on in this whole question of can narcissists change, I want to quickly go through some terms just so you have some background. Uh, when we use the word narcissist, what most people now in the lay audience and the, uh, the, the average reader, the average person out there means is somebody who's extremely narcissistic. They mean, in other words, someone with narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, but there, there is a whole range, uh, and hopefully we can get into that a little bit, but just terms first. To call someone a narcissist in the research or uh, in the clinical literature may or may not mean that they are disordered. They may or may not have narcissistic personality disorder. In fact, what it means is they're simply higher in narcissistic traits on a measure than the average person. Uh, NPD, like most personality disorders, is a pervasive disturbance in the person's ability to manage their feelings, to organize their emotions, to manage their relationships, to maintain healthy intimacy in relationships, uh, even to maintain their career. It's a severe disturbance and it's pervasive. Even when a person is fairly highly functioning, you will see, meaning if they're, they, they seem to be fairly well put together at times, you'll see outbreaks of these problems. One thing that in particular happens if they get anxious often, they don't think as clearly, it's something called a, a thought disorder, which is really common uh, when somebody is struggling with a personality disorder. Now, the, the DSM uh, actually makes it very uh, confusing. The current DSM-5 makes it very confusing as to how to understand the nature of narcissistic personality disorder, but there are some very simple ways to understand it. Uh, what I want to do is outline those for you. Let's talk about narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, I, I don't want to get too bogged down. I, I go over much of this in detail in, in Rethinking Narcissism, but a lot of questions also came up. How do I know if somebody is extremely narcissistic? Really the question was, how do I know if they're a narcissist? And again, when most people use that word now, they're talking about someone with narcissistic personality disorder. Really the, the best way to understand if that's what you're dealing with is to look for what I call the three E's. Uh, exploitation uh, that is a pattern a pervasive pattern of doing whatever it takes to get the get your needs met uh, entitlement acting as the world and other people owe them uh, and empathy impairments this is a really important point to make we used to and it's still widespread out there people talk about the, a lack of empathy or, or somebody with uh, narcissistic personality disorder, even being incapable of empathy. That's an old understanding. It's an old understanding of empathy. We now since have learned that there, actually there was a, a, a review of research, a large body of research from some uh, a group of psychologists who've done a lot of work on empathy. And what they've concluded is just looking at how it all works is that empathy is really a choice uh, that we all have this capacity unless we have some kind of neurological deficit. And in the case of, of psychopathy, that might actually be what's going on. Uh, but what happens is we become blocked, we become preoccupied. Now, what all narcissists, uh, extremely narcissistic people, narcissists who have NPD have in common, is they have a strong drive to feel special. This is a point I want to make really clear. Uh, and this is what I go into great detail. The first three quarters of Rethinking Narcissism is devoted to helping people understand what's bad about narcissism in a different way. This goes to that question of how do I know if a person can change or how do I know if somebody is, is narcissistic. Um, if you are looking at uh, somebody who is extremely narcissistic, if you're looking at somebody with narcissistic personality disorder uh, who shows those signs of triple E uh, 
it can take many different forms because what I want you to start to think of narcissism as is uh, an addiction. It's like an addiction to feeling special. But remember, there's lots of ways to feel special. So when most people think of the word narcissist or narcissism, they think of vague, preening, primping, vain, excuse me, preening, primping, boastful braggarts like reality TV types. But the reality is not all narcissists care about looks or fame or money, and some can be extremely quiet. Uh, so you need to know what they all have in common. And one thing they all have in common is this extreme drive to feel special. And now the triple E makes sense. Think of it like an addiction to feeling special, where just like any drug that somebody uses to soothe themselves, they'll lie, steal, cheat, do whatever it takes to get their high. But there's lots of ways to get the high. So you can feel special by being the most misunderstood person in the room. Uh, there's a kind of narcissism I call introverted narcissism. It's often called hypersensitive or covert narcissism in the research. I prefer introverted. I think it's clearer and cleaner because they are introverted. Um, and so they can be shy and even self-doubting. But they answer questions like, I'm temperamentally different than most people. They agree with statements like that. Or they agree with statements like, um, N nobody understands the kind of problems that I have. You can see that has nothing to do with self-esteem. So that is introverted narcissism, the really bold one that people tend to think of, the charmer, the manipulator, open manipulator, uh, is uh, extroverted narcissism, exactly the way it sounds. They tend to be very outgoing, uh, they, they are, are drawn to, to, to fame, to fortune, they might be focused on their looks, that's the classic idea of narcissism we tend to think of but now there's a third category this came up in the questions too uh, about somebody who's so focused on feeling like their most helpful person in the world uh, that that's what makes them special that's what makes them stand out from the other seven billion people on the planet this is called communal narcissism in the research people score high on it are called communal narcissists and i have no doubt that as the diagnosis continues to develop we will add that crit that that into the criteria uh, so that it's not just so focused on this idea of the bold the brash at least now the dsm-5 touches on this idea of vulnerability uh, uh, which I, I don't i don't really like that word because if narcissists could be extremely vulnerable they wouldn't have the trouble they do in relationships i think what people mean by that is fragile or reactive and it's not the same thing um but so communal narcissists actually agree with statements like, I'm the most helpful person I know. So you can see there's this whole variety. And as it becomes more and more extreme, we get into disorder. We can have disordered versions of these high trait uh, narcissists. Now back to the question. So that's the background. I can even tell you a little bit about how I've reconfigured the, uh, the spectrum because that's important to some other questions that came up. Um, can you trust? First of all, uh, anybody who is changing, it doesn't matter if they're working on their struggles with alcoholism, it doesn't matter if they're working on their struggles with, with gambling or, or, or even self-esteem, they're gonna have moments where they backslide. And if you think of this like an addiction, people have slips with addictions. So as soon as you start viewing it this way, uh, that, that extremely narcissistic people are addicted to feeling special and they use that to soothe themselves instead of when they're sad or scared or lonely turning to others for, for openly for, for support and depending on, on them in emotionally healthy ways it's a self-soothing of a kind just like a, a drug it's hard to beat an addiction it takes time so one thing you want to understand is even if a person is devoted to doing the work, and many people who are extremely narcissistic might not be, it, 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 you're signing on for a long haul and you have to decide if that's something that you wanna do. There will be slips. Anybody who's devoted to change is gonna make mistakes, they're gonna slip back, and in this case, this means more narcissism. Now, the one thing I also wanna make clear in response to this question is you, you, you can't know for sure what's going on. Only time will tell and behavior will tell, but some things will make it clear. So for example, if, if your partner 
who is devoted to change is able to, in a genuine, authentic way, tell you when they're sad, tell you when they're lonely, instead of turning to these narcissistic ways of coping, which usually include things like uh, being argumentative and try having to be right, uh, finding someone to put on a pedestal, whether it's you or, or others. We can talk about reasons why that is. Um, or, or even being downright demeaning in the case of, of abuse. Uh, if they can be open and vulnerable, more importantly, if you can see that they are touched by your pain. We know this from the research, that true repair in a relationship happens when people feel uh, like their partner really gets on an emotional level how they hurt them. That is true change. If, if you see that, then yes, there's hope for, for any of the problems, but that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be slips back into old behavior because there are for any part of change. And you have to decide whether or not you want to stick around for that work. That is a very personal decision. But caveats, uh, because this came up a, lo a, a lot as well. Uh, when, when are there signs of danger? Well, uh, narcissism at its most dangerous is marked by th the presence of three patterns of behavior. Uh, if you are in a relationship where somebody is emotionally and physically abusive, calling you names, gaslighting, for those of you who don't know, that's where the person is continually trying to convince you that you're the quote unquote crazy one. Um, that is a form of emotional abuse and it can be quite devastating. Uh, so ongoing emotional and physical abuse, if the person shows a pattern of denial, all right, I'm answering about 10 questions with this one. Can someone be helped if they're in denial of their problem? No, no, they can't. They can't, and I, I just want you to be really clear about this. I call these the three stop signs in, in rethinking narcissism. Ongoing emotional physical abuse where the person can't acknowledge and won't change it. You're in a dangerous situation. You need to get support and help in leaving. You need to break your isolation. Uh, call uh, the 1-800-ABUSE, the, uh, abuse, the abuse hotline. I'd look for local supports. Um, you, you need help from a professional th figuring out what is keeping you stuck in that relationship because it cannot get better and you cannot ha there is no hope if there's no safety in the relationship denial going back to denial if you see signs of denial um, where the person can't even admit in some small way I think there's something wrong they won't go to therapy another bad sign if somebody's in denial, it doesn't matter what the problem is, whether it's gambling, whether it's, uh, whether it's being extremely narcissistic, uh, substance abuse, it's not going to get better. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. If you can't look at it, if you can't look at it closely and work on it, nothing is going to be any different. And the third is psychopathy. Briefly, psychopathy is a pattern of remorseless lies and deceit. This is where the person lies without flinching to your face over and over again. Uh, it may be a hint of extreme psychopathy, and there's some evidence that people who are extremely psychopathic don't even experience emotions in quite the same way. The combination of extreme psychopathy and extreme narcissism, where somebody is, has narcissistic personality disorder and a strong streak of psychopathy, this is where the problems blend together. Very often, this is somebody who uh, falls into what's called cluster B in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I forgot to say that out, spell that acronym out before for the DSM-5. Uh, and the combination of psychopathy and narcissism is dangerous. It's been known for a long time as malignant narcissism. Uh, and if you see that combination, if you see those three stop signs, I want you to, I want you to get help at thinking about what helps, what keeps you stuck, and maybe we can talk about some of those things. 
uh, and what will, will, what will help you leave, especially if the person has no commitment to change. No, there is no hope if the person is in denial. That's very clear. In fact, in a research study uh, where they actually measured denial, starting in an early age, over 20 years, uh, people who showed denial throughout their life as a way of coping grew up to become uh, extremely narcissistic, express a lot of unhealthy narcissism, uh, the triple E, if you will, all the nasty qualities. Uh, and, and so denial is a, is a really strong predictor of, of, of the worst outcomes. If you see denial, it is not a good sign. So let me pause here. I just want to take a look at some other questions and make sure I, I've covered uh, what's emblematic uh, in Susan's question. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a leap of faith here when anybody is trying to change. Uh, but you want to keep in mind the three stop signs. You want to keep in mind the definition of narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder, as I've outlined in a very simple way, which is triple E. Um, and if you see the presence of those things, it becomes less hopeful because you want to think of it like an extreme addiction. And that's a long haul process, just like if somebody is addicted, uh, strongly addicted to a drug, they may be in and out of rehab. Uh, so I hope that provides some clarity. Valerie asks, I'm wondering if it's possible to heal a person who won't admit they're a liar or accountable to what they do. I've answered that, no. Uh, one common pattern, uh, so for, especially for extroverted narcissists, one person asks, Lee asks, if it's a, if it's a, what, a sign of somebody being extremely narcissistic when they are, say, watch TV and look, compare themselves to other people and say, I'm better than they are. And, um, it seems to me that he's actually very insecure. Is that a type of behavior common for those who have NPD? Absolutely, it's a common behavior for people who have narcissistic personality disorder. Envy or uh, envious spoiling, sour grapes. Um, if a person is secure in themselves, they don't need to put others down in order to feel good about themselves. Uh, so it's so, and it is very common. And no, you will hear research out there that narcissists are insecure whether they are at the milder range, whether they're just high in traits, or they have NPD, I do not believe that's the case. I went to great pains in my own research on the narcissism spectrum scale to untangle the healthy from the unhealthy because I think that's come out because people have mixed those together and I'm not alone. There are now two other measures, uh, one older one and one brand new one that separate out uh, the bright side of narcissism from the, from the unhealthy, which is exploitation, entitlement, and empathy impairments. Um, and a little word on empathy impairments, the reason it gets very confusing for people when they're in a relationship is, uh, as I was talking about earlier, for most of us, we have the capacity. So it's now understood that somebody even with narcissistic personality disorder has uh, fluctuating empathy. If they are motivated and they are not blocked, you may see flashes of it, flashes of it in relationships with, say, affair partners or even you, and that's what gets confusing. You cannot use that as an indicator. Uh, as I said, a better indicator is triple E, um, and, and where you think of the empathy as fluctuating. It's not like it's not there sometimes. Uh, and I, I'll get into some five early warning signs. Uh, and hopefully we can get into some of those because those those are common no matter what kind of narcissism, whether it's introverted, extroverted, or communal, somebody has. This comes from Heather. Are narcissistic people even capable of feeling love? This is somebody where uh, the, their partner uh, seems to be a sex addict. And this, this came up in a lot of questions, finding pornography on his phone. Um, and shows no emotion except for anger. Yep, that's one of the actually, that's one of the warning signs. So are they capable of feeling love? The answer is, it depends. It depends if they're in the milder range. 
uh, because I, I also want to speak to people out there who are not experiencing abuse, where they're with a partner, where they feel neglected, uh, where they feel like their partner is arrogant and aloof. There are no put downs. Uh, they, they don't, they, there's no physical abuse, but you feel alone, more alone in the relationship than you do when you're, when you're by yourself. Somehow you feel more lonely and emotionally isolated. Um, the milder the form of narcissism, I call the subtle narcissism in, uh, in my book, Rethinking Narcissism. This is somebody who, they have the grandiosity. Uh, all people who are narcissistic, as you could tell from the description, have the grandiosity. Um, but they may not be outward about it. It may be secret dreams that they keep hidden, and then it just sort of flares up at a moment they feel insecure. They hover not at the extreme end where they would be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, uh, but they show other signs, and let me talk about those. And then they sort of then they can spike into even the range of pathology in moments where they feel insecure. This is what I call subtle narcissism, and I call the problem the hallmark of subtle narcissism the entitlement surge, where suddenly they're cut off what people often call supplies problem happens at work, they don't get a promotion, something happens that shakes their self-esteem, and suddenly you're on the receiving end of all kinds of demands because part of what entitlement does is it gives people a sense of control and it gives them a sense of power uh, and that helps them feel special. If you're bowing down to me and, and I don't have to ask you for anything, I don't have to feel dependent on you, I can just get what I want, uh, then, uh, then I can feel special in that way. So the entitlement surges. Uh, at the lower range, yeah, you're going to see, this is what gets confusing, you're going to see signs where the person can be very loving and very caring in moments until something blocks them, until something blocks their empathy. Very often people who are extremely narcissistic have had traumas in their past and, that, uh, and, and have, have been abused or neglected um, and they wind up cutting off uh, their emotions are getting good at cutting off their emotions, hence the pattern of lying and the, and the way the sense of love seems to come and go. So are they capable of love? The question is, is your partner capable of the kind of love that you want? That is reliable. That is secure. What we call secure attachment. That is where you're feeling sad or scared or lonely or blue. Uh, that you know that you can turn to them and they can understand and they can be there for you No matter what like that one special person in your life that gets you that that understands you um, uh, Can they love you in that way and that's the question you have to answer That's what you have to be really clear about um, I want to go through a couple of the early warning signs because rather than you getting distracted by is this person loud or arrogant or vain um, I, I want you to be clear about uh, what true danger signs reliable danger signs are because they cut it to, to the core of what drives people to become extremely narcissistic uh, 